uh, with ETFs and mutual funds. Approximately 3 million retail investors rely on closed-end funds as a source of retirement savings and investment opportunities. But the SEC currently limits their investment in private securities to just 15 percent of the fund's net assets. We should allow public offered closed-end funds to invest all their assets in private securities to increase retail investor exposure to private markets while maintaining investor protection. Finally, we must provide equity composite, uh, compensation for gig workers who make up a quarter, over a quarter now, uh, of the U.S. workforce and play a vital role in our 21st century economy. These workers deserve the same opportunities for financial stability and growth as traditional employees. Expanding opportunities for all investors and entrepreneurs is not just a moral imperative, but it is also essential for the growth and prosperity of our economy. I want to thank you all, and I look forward to our discussion in this critical issue. I now would like to recognize the ranking member, gentleman from California, Mr. Sherman, uh, for five minutes uh, to give his opening remarks. Thank you. I look forward to working with you as we've worked for so many years on both financial services and foreign affairs. Uh, I uh, look forward to the two hearings today, which are to some extent overlapping in their subject matter. I want to thank the uh, following Democratic members for serving on uh, this subcommittee. Um, we have uh, the uh, gentleman from New York who's uh, chair of the Foreign Affairs Committee and is in another room that I may have to run to, uh, Mr. Meeks. We have Mr. Scott uh, from Georgia, who is a ranking member on uh, uh, agriculture. We have Mr. Vargas from the great state of California, the gentleman from, uh, uh, from New Jersey, Mr. Gottheimer, the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Gonzalez, and the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Uh, Kasten, um, who was our uh, subcommittee vice chair uh, last Congress, and the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Cleaver, who is the ranking member on the Housing and Insurance Subcommittee. All of those are returning from last Congress. We also have Mr. Lynch, who served on this uh, subcommittee uh, previously, and Mr. Wiley Nickel, who's the only uh, complete freshman who is joining us, and I'm sure he'll be here soon. Uh, the titles of the hearings that we're holding today imply that every investor protection is a barrier, and it is. It's a barrier to what might be a great investment. It's a barrier to uh, what might be fraud or an ill-suited investment or just a bad deal. Uh, the fact is we read the right blend of investor protection and securities regulation on the one hand and access to capital and access to investments on the other. We should not always be saying that we go in one direction or the other. The proof that securities regulation is actually helpful to those trying to raise capital uh, is illustrated by the fact that all over the world people send their money to be invested in countries that have good securities protection, whether that be London, whether that be New York, whether that may be elsewhere. In the presence of good investor protection, you get more capital <laughs> invested in the markets. So investor protection not only invest, uh, protects investors, it's necessary for the business economy as a whole uh, that is seeking investment. As to the topic uh, of this hearing today, which focuses on uh, the definition of accredited uh, investor, uh, found in Regulation D and elsewhere, um, I, uh, I'm not here to defend it. Uh, we need a definition of a private placement that makes sense, the, uh, and that doesn't mean it should be more restrictive or less restrictive that we have now, but it should be different. Um, uh, the uh, chairwoman uh, focuses on the sophisticated uh, investor or accredited investor definition and points out that if you win the lottery on Monday, that doesn't make you an investment genius on Tuesday just because you have a million dollars in the bank. Furthermore, the definition of a million dollars, that's a 1982 definition. So it was either wrong then or it's wrong now, but it's completely uh, a completely different amount of money. Uh, and very few people are saying, well, just index that for inflation and you got a great regulation because the fact, uh, as the chairwoman points out, is just because you're uh, rich does not mean uh, that you're in a good position to evaluate investments. But what we could do is change the definition of accredited investor to the following standards. Someone who's investing less than 5% of their net worth in a particular investment. And someone who either by their virtue of their own licensed uh, licenses uh, and standards 
uh, is a sophisticated investor or someone whose um, uh, uh, advisor is sophisticated, but that advisor needs to be a fiduciary, truly independent, not receiving a commission, and not expecting to get uh, referred business from the promoter because you can have an advisor who's sophisticated as hell, they are sophisticated in knowing who's paying their fee and who's referring their, the, them the next client. And if that's the promoter, I would rather have a dumb investment advisor who was loyal to me than a smart one who was loyal to someone else. Uh, so uh, I uh, uh, want to thank uh, the gentlelady uh, for holding this hearing and make history in this subcommittee by yielding back almost 40 seconds. Wow. <laughs> well done to the ranking member. That's a first, see? All right, wonderful. And uh, today we're going to welcome the testimony first of uh, Mizami Bell, the founder of Black Girl Ventures. Black Girl Ventures is an organization here in DC that is focused on providing underserved female founders with access to community networks, capital, and capacity building to develop and grow their businesses. Ms. Bell's organization has funded 264 women of color and served over 2,000 participants who are collectively generating over $10 million in revenue and supporting 3,000 jobs. Next, we have Mr. David Olivencia, and he is the CEO and co-founder of Angels Investors. Mr. Alavencia is an experienced angel investor and is active in the minority angel investor community. Formerly a managing director at Accenture, Mr. Alavencia uh, recently assumed the CEO role at Angels Investors, a Latino-focused angel group with nearly 200 members. He is also a member of Irish Angels and serves as an advisor to commune, to commune angels. A lot of angels. <laughs> Ms. Jennifer Schulp is the Director of Financial Regulation Studies at the Center for Monetary and Financial Alternatives uh, at the Cato Institute. There she focuses on securities and capital markets regulation. Prior to joining Cato, Ms. Schulp was a uh, Director in the De uh, Department of Enforcement at the Financial Industry Regulatory, Re Regulatory Authority, or we call it FINRA representing FINRA in investments and disciplinary proceedings relating to violations of the federal securities laws and self-regulatory organization rules. Next, we have Mr. Eli Velasquez, founder and managing partner of Investors of Color Network. As managing partner, Mr. Velasquez works to, cl uh, to close, close the funding gap in startup capital by facilitating syndicated investments in early stage companies for underrepresented accredited investors. The investors of Color Network are, uh, is composed of over 800 investors representing the entire continuum of capital, including angel investors, ad hoc investment networks, venture capital, revenue-based investment firms, family offices, and other capital providers. And last but not least, we have Ms. Gina Gale Fletcher. Ms. Fletcher is a professor of law at Duke University, specializing in research on financial regulation and market manipulation. She was previously an associate with the law firm of Gibson Dunn. We want to thank each of you for taking the time to be here this morning. Each of you will be recognized for five minutes to give an oral presentation of your testimony. And without objection, each of your written statements will be made a part of the record. Ms. Bell. You are now recognized for five minutes to give your oral remarks. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Commissioner Wagner. Do you have your, your button on? Thank you. Good morning, Subcommittee Chair Wagner, Ranking Member Sherman, um, Chairman McHenry, Ranking Member Waters, and esteemed members of the Subcommittee on Capital Markets. It's an honor to speak with you today about the importance of access to financial education and opportunity through investment. My name is Shelly Omilade Bell, please call me Omi, and I'm the CEO and founder of Black Girl Ventures. We are a nonprofit organization that provides access to capital, capacity, and community to black and brown women founders. And a quick update, to date, Black Girl Ventures has funded 450 black and brown women-owned businesses across 15 cities. Our founders represent 10 million in revenue for the U.S. economy and 3,000 jobs. I founded Black Girl Ventures after a wide-ranging career path. I'm an HBCU graduate, a computer scientist, and a serial entrepreneur. 
I've worked in workforce development for the, for the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office as a teacher and as a performance poet. And in every role, at every milestone of life, I have both experienced personally and witnessed in communities I serve how systematic barriers to financial education prevent middle class, low income, and especially black and brown people from gaining economic mobility and building wealth. Entrepreneurship was my pathway out of poverty. As a single mother who had just had her second child, I found myself on public assistance. Despite holding a full-time job as a teacher and a degree in computer science, because as almost 12% of Americans know well, holding a traditional full-time job was not enough to provide financial security for my family. In 2015, I launched a custom merchandise print shop that was profitable enough to deliver my family and I out of public assistance and into a six-figure income. My mom invested her retirement money of $10,000 into my print shop, and if she had not, I would likely still be receiving public assistance. Due to systematic barriers, most founders in the black community do not get a friends and family realm to see their businesses. And investment opportunities to scale businesses are even further out of reach. In 2016, I read a report that black women in the US were starting businesses at six times the national average, yet receiving less than 1% of venture capital. In 2023, that has not changed. I launched Black Girl Ventures from a living room in Southeast DC with this statistic in mind and history as an inspiration. In the early 1900s, during the Harlem Renaissance, when white landowners raised rents, black tenants would throw parties for an admission fee that would, use, that would be used to pay their rent. I used the same model to build Black Girl Ventures and essentially built the largest rent party for entrepreneurs on the East Coast. Black Girl Ventures is the family and friends round for black and brown women founders. Over the course of the last seven years, I've read and reviewed over 1,000 applications for pitching for funding. I've trained over 5,000 people in marketing, business development, and fundraising. As a result, my organization has provided over $3 million in funding to early stage, early stage businesses that have gone on to hire employees and gain shelf space in the largest retailers in the country. And yet, even after all of my professional experiences and the life experience of managing a household, raising two children, and becoming financially sufficient via entrepreneurship, under the current definition of accredited investor, I was deemed not sophisticated enough. This means I was shut out of investing in the businesses I believed in before anyone did while investors who were already wealthy stood to benefit. The SEC last updated its definition in 2020 in an attempt to address diversity and equity concerns, but the addition of credential, credentials and certification requirements neglect equally relevant markers of financial sophistication. Black and brown people, low-income people, and middle-class people are standing in the back of a proverbial line ordered by race, generational wealth, and access to resources. Every time you feel like you've gotten closer, the rules change to help or protect those at the front of the line. The lack of access to even the systems that aren't perfect should still be considered a diversity and equity issue. If diversity is good for investment, diversity is also good for investors. I'm not an advocate for deregulation, but education and increased access to financial education and investing. Reviewing the definition of accredited investors must involve striking the right balance between protecting investors and the public interest while increasing access and investment opportunities for historically excluded communities. It's a step in the right direction to have such an esteemed panel today to share expertise and to further the efforts of building an economy where all people can have equitable access to pathways to create wealth. I am grateful for the subcommittee's attention to this issue, and I look forward to working with you as our conversations continue, because quite frankly, change can't come soon enough for the founders we serve at Black Girl Ventures and thousands of black and brown business owners across the country. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bell, and congratulations to you. Thank uh, you. Next, we will hear uh, uh, Mr. Alaventia. You are recognized for five minutes to give your, uh, uh, your testimony. Thank you, Chair Wagner, uh, Ranking Member Sherman, and distinguished members of the subcommittee and capital markets. Uh, my name is David Olavencia. I'm a senior technology executive, early stage investor, co-founder of national leadership organizations, and currently CEO of Angeles Investors. As CEO of Angeles Investors, I have the honor to represent and serve close to 200 national members and amazing partners with a mission to find fund and grow the most promising Hispanic and Latinx ventures. In addition to my role at Angeles Investors, I serve on the board of Notre Dame affiliated Irish Angels and am board advisor to Detroit-based Commune Angels who have a focus on diversity 
and expanding access to angel investing. My life and career journey, as well as my success in early stage investing, was not easy and could only have happened in America. My parents and grandparents came to the southeast side of Chicago in the late 1940s from Puerto Rico. They had minimal to zero resources and more like zero. My, my grandmothers were cooks in a Puerto Rican restaurant. My father dropped out of high school to support my grandmother and later earned his GED in the Army. So I have a strong affiliation for our armed services. I was the first in my extended family to graduate from college and went to, on to pursue a successful career in the rapidly growing technology industry. In my career, I saw the amazing impact that te technology was having on, on the world. While earning my MBA at Notre Dame, I learned about startups and how they were leveraging technology to scale. I also learned about early stage investments, which were largely a secret space or, or a club. It was a space that the wealthy were investing in. There were amazing companies like Google, Amazon, YouTube, Uber, and others that were leveraging technology to grow rapidly. Early investors in these companies were making outsized returns and reinvesting those returns in the next set of successful startups. Like those early stage investors, I wanted to get involved. Although I had carefully studied this asset class while earning my MBA from a top school, I sadly could not participate because I did not meet the income or net worth requirements to qualify as an accredited investor. I also unfortunately did not have any inherited family wealth. Um, a few years after I graduated, I qualified as an accredited investor and joined Irish Angels, where I began my angel investing journey. I have since built a portfolio of approximately seven, 70 companies. But as I've learned more about angel investing industry, I saw that very few Hispanic, black, or female investors uh, that were investing alongside of me. Furthermore, I learned that less than 2% of the venture funds went to Hispanic founders despite the fact that roughly 20 to 30% of the U.S. population is Hispanic and that this com community contributes about $3 trillion to our U.S. GDP. And they're also a major, the, our community is a major fund of the pension funds that fund these, these venture capital firms. Women and black startup founders also receive only about 2% of all venture funding. Rather than complaining about the issue, in 2020 I joined forces with visionary leaders, co-founders, and founding members to create and build Angelus Investors. At Angelus Investors, we are one of the largest and fastest growing angel groups in the world. In partnership with the Angel Capital Association and others, we provide training and education to enable our members and investors to learn more about this asset class and better evaluate startup companies. I often hear from non-accredited leaders in our community who express a desire to invest in companies that we invest in, but cannot due to the accredited investor standard. To emphasize my point, I will tell a true story about Carlos, a young professional from Southern California who earned an MBA from a leading university. As Angelis was preparing to invest in the seed round of Canela Media, he approached me and passionately asked if he could invest. I asked him if he was qualified as an accredited investor, and he sadly said no. He asked, is there another way that I can invest? I really believe in the company, the CEO. I understand their business model through my MBA studies. I said, sadly, you can't. In the time since our investment, Canela Media's revenue has grown substantially, and now they employ more than 100 employees. They've received numerous awards, and its CEO was recently recognized an Ernst & Young Entrepreneur of the Year. Every time I see another award or growth milestone for Canela Media, I scratch my head and I ask why Carlos was not able to invest in this great company. I'm committed to working with others to improve the accredited investor definition and increase investment access for a wider range of potential investors. I look forward to partnering with each of you for reforms that, that allow thousands of younger versions of Carlos and myself to participate in this asset class. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Olaventia, and uh, congratulations and kudos to you also. Uh, next, I'd like to recognize uh, Ms. Schultz. You are now recognized for five minutes uh, to give your oral testimony. Chair Wagner, Ranking Member Sherman, and distinguished members of the Subcommittee on Capital Markets. My name is Jennifer Schulp, and I am the Director of Financial Regulation Studies at the Cato Institute Center for Monetary and Financial Alternatives. 
thank you for the opportunity to take part in today's hearing. Private securities offerings are diverse and include direct investment in individual companies as well as pooled investment into private equity, hedge, or other funds. Such offerings, which represent a large portion of the capital raised in U.S. markets, are often made pursuant to exem exemptions provided in Rule 506 of the SEC's Regulation D. Almost twice as much money was raised under Rule 506B than by all registered offerings between July 1, 2021 and June 30, 2022. And offerings under Rule 506C, a less popular exemption, raised more money than was raised in IPOs. But whether a person is eligible to invest in a Rule 506 offering is largely determined by whether he or she meets the definition of an accredited investor. Under SEC rules, an accredited investor is a natural person with a net worth that exceeds $1 million, not including their primary residence, or an annual income of at least $200,000, or $300,000 with a spouse. To put this into perspective, the SEC estimates that about 13% of U.S. households qualify as accredited investors. Thus, approximately 90% of American households are unable to participate and the segment of capital raising that dwarfs the investing opportunities available in public markets. This alone should raise a red flag as to the wisdom of the accredited investor definition. But the problems with the definition go beyond this simple fact. Most fundamentally, the accredited investor definition is objectionable because it gives the SEC the authority to limit how people can invest their own money. But even when judged by its own goal of limiting private offerings to investors with sufficient financial sophistication, the accredited investor definition is ineffective. Being wealthy is no proxy for financial sophistication. This line drawing lumps the elderly with substantial retirement savings and lottery winners with windfall profits in with people whose earnings have depended on some financial know-how. It also excludes those who do not have a substantial nest egg but have a great deal of general investment knowledge or have experience with the industry in which they seek to invest. A generic wealth test is also a poor fit if the goal is to limit access to private investments to only those who can afford to take the loss. Loss tolerance rests on more than a naive wealth determination. For example, older investors may be more sensitive to loss than younger investors who have a longer investing time horizon. The truth is that no simple blanket rule can capture individual investor sophistication. This mismatch between bright line wealth tests and investor sophistication, however, is not just a theoretical concern. By excluding middle and low, lower income individuals from many of the offerings in the market, the current regulatory regime limits their ability to amass wealth, diversify holdings, and hedge certain risks. There are fewer public companies today than there were 20 years ago, and companies tend to be more mature when they go public. This means that many companies are past their high growth phase by the time most people can invest in them. In short, people have fewer choices in the public markets, and what choices they may have offer, may offer lower potential returns and fewer opportunities for diversification. Moreover, by reserving private market opportunities for the already wealthy, the accredited investor definition reinforces wealth gaps that exist in American society. Those who qualify as accredited investors are disproportionately white and concentrated on the country's high income coasts. This unequal impact on less wealthy groups also harms entrepreneurs who look to their own communities to furnish needed capital. Breaking down society's wealth divide requires removing barriers to opportunities for investors and entrepreneurs to make financial gains. The accredited investor definition should be reformed at a minimum to allow more investors the opportunities afforded by private offerings. Thank you, and I welcome any questions that you may have. Thank you for your testimony, Ms. Schulte. And now we turn to Mr. Velasquez. You're recognized for five minutes to give your testimony. Thank you, Chair Wagner, Ranking Member Sherman, and distinguished members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify this morning. My name is Eli Velasquez, and I appear today on behalf of the Angel Capital Association, where I serve on the Board of Directors. ACA is the Professional Society of Angel Investors in the U.S., representing more than 16,000 members, encompassing all parts of the early-stage entrepreneurship ecosystem, from individuals and family offices to angel funds. 
ACA offers education and collaboration to its members in all 50 states, sharing best practices in early stage investing. Accredited angel investors are the wellspring of early stage capital in so many small and mid-sized communities. We take seriously this responsibility of helping to build and educate the next generation of investors and entrepreneurs with a focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion. Because of this, ACA has been leading efforts to educate minority entrepreneurs on how to engage with angel investors and raise early stage capital as well as efforts to diversify our investor base. The work of this committee to improve opportunities for a more diverse group of investors and entrepreneurs will be critical. ACA as an organization welcomes the opportunity to share our expertise and feedback in this effort. My own professional journey illustrates the importance of reducing barriers to entry for becoming an accredited investor. My written statement describes this in more detail, but I began as an engineer working on the Delta rockets for Boeing. I earned a law degree at night while working full time and along the way moved over to Boeing's intellectual property business unit. It was there that I first heard the term angel investor from a wealthy friend who described the wealth and income requirements to become an angel, and it sounded completely unattainable. After graduating from uh, law school, I returned to my hometown of El Paso, where I co-founded the Binational Sustainability Laboratory, a technology incubator that aimed to commercialize technologies on both sides of the U.S.-Mexico border. With funding from public and private partners in both the U.S. and Mexico, I worked with more than 200 early stage companies, investors, and partners to support the commercialization of technologies from universities, labs, and local inventors. From there, I led the El Paso and West Texas Regional Centers for Innovation and Commercialization, where I helped to vet deals and research opportunities across 93 counties for funding from the $200 million Texas Emerging Technology Fund. I also started to support the management of the Camino Real Angels, an El Paso-based angel investor group whose members were all older white males, despite El Paso's population being more than 80% Hispanic. I was doing the work, evaluating hundreds of investment opportunities, but could only pass that information along with no opportunity to participate. In 2015, I co-founded the Lubbock Angel Network, a coordinated effort amongst the university, local economic development, and state that has now invested over five million across 30 companies with a handful of exits. But still, I could not participate despite being more financially secure and only about $20,000 from the accredited investor income threshold. In contrast, one member of the Lubbock Angel Group was a 20-something professional, brand new to angel investing, who leveraged his family's trust to achieve the accredited investor status. It was not until 2020 when I was working with a nonprofit organization to design and deploy the U.S. State Department Just Investors Program that I was finally able to write my first check as an accredited investor. After 22 years as a rocket scientist, IP expert, nonprofit founder, university executive, and founder of angel groups all over the world, I was finally able to write a check. My work with Just Investors program showed me how communities in the Middle East, Latin America, and Southeast Asia have developed inclusive approaches to get as many investors as possible trained and engaged in angel investing. This inspired me to found Investors of Color in the U.S. with my business partner who serves as CEO of Black VC. Investors of Color is a national network of diverse accredited investors across the capital stack committed to building wealth for and by underrepresented communities. What I have learned through my own experience and in founding investors of color is that in order to mobilize more capital and engage more underrepresented individuals into angel investing, we need to reduce barriers to entry for becoming an accredited investor. The ACA has identified policy changes that can help increase the number of accredited investors. We ask that Congress, one, amend the definition of accredited investor to include certain licenses or qualifying education or experience. Two, Formalize investor education by directing the SEC to create an examination for accredited investors. Three, require additional certifications, including reassessment, every five years. Four, require the SEC to allow sell certification. Five, implement investment safeguards. We also urge you not to increase the current minimum income thresholds for investor accreditation. And we recommend that you require membership in a professional organizations such as the Angel Capital Association or the National Venture Capital Association. As I said, my fellow members of the ACA and I are eager to serve as resources and feedback as you pursue legislative solutions to make capital more readily available to our nation's entrepreneurs, particularly communities that are currently underserved. Thank you. I thank you for your testimony, Mr. Uh, Velasquez. And now we turn to Professor Gina Gale Fletcher. My apologies for leaving that title off of your uh, uh, name. You have more than earned it. So, uh, Professor Fletcher, you are now recognized for five minutes to give your testimony. Thank you, Chair Wagner. 
Chair Wagner, Ranking Member Sherman, and esteemed members of the subcommittee, thank you so much for your invitation to speak with you today. I am a professor at Duke University School of Law, where I study and teach complex financial instruments and market regulation. I'm also a member of the board of the Healthy Markets Association, an investor trade group that focuses on market efficiency and fairness, as well as a member of the SEC's Investor Advisory Committee, we, uh, where we are scheduled to actually have a meeting on these issues in just a few weeks. Now, while I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you this morning, I do question the premise of this hearing. The expansion, the expansion of the private markets put investors in our economy at risk. No amount of wealth or sophistication is a substitute for robust securities laws that ensure that all investors, not just the wealthy or connected, get the information they need to make informed investment decisions. Some have suggested that limiting private offerings to accredited investors somehow discriminates against those who do not meet the definitions. Some have also argued that the SEC should allow companies, funds, brokers, and others to offer and sell securities uh, um, to offer and sell private market securities to retail investors. All of this, of course, in the name of investor choice and capital formation. This is perverse logic at best. The public markets are where all investors are generally treated fairly and equally, regardless of wealth, sophistication, or connections. The private markets are the very opposite of that. Expanding the definition of accredited investor is not going to result in more investors becoming millionaires. Rather, it would expand the opportunities for wealth extraction and amplify wealth inequality. When Congress passed the federal securities laws, it determined that if companies want to raise money from the public, they have to provide the public, that includes investors of all levels of sophistication and wealth, basic financial governance and operational information. Contrary to much of the rhetoric that we hear today, the requirement that companies make basic disclosures is about protecting and promoting capitalism, not just protecting small investors. Unfortunately, this essential bargain between information and capital formation has been destroyed by decades of deregulation. Approximately 40 years ago, the SEC permitted companies to offer and sell securities without registering with the agency if the investors were wealthy enough. The underlying presumption was that these investors, the wealthy and the connected, do not need the protection of the federal securities laws because of their wealth and sophistication. Time and experience have consistently demonstrated that this assumption is misguided. There are several reasons why allowing retail investors access to private offerings would be deeply problematic, both for retail investors and our markets overall, but I do wish to highlight a few this morning. First, retail investors will generally not be provided with sufficiently comprehensive, reliable, and comparable information so as to make an informed investment decision. They would be dependent upon the willingness of the company or private fund to provide it. No amount of education will change the lack of information that is innate in the private markets. Second, while institutional investors might be able to adjust if they can't get their money back, retail investors generally cannot do so. Retail investors that are invested in stocks, bonds, options, and mutual funds can generally sell their investments near instantly. In the private markets, retail investors may not be able to sell at all. Third, in the public markets, you can easily determine the value of what you own by simply looking it up on the internet, looking at the NYSE or the NASDAQ. With private market investments, valuations such as those in venture capital and private equity funds are often just what a few connected and often conflicted insiders say they are. As illustrated by the now bankrupt uh, FTX's valuation, going from eight to 18 to $32 billion over less than two years ago, these valuations are often unsupported. Fourth, retail investors simply are not going to get the promising opportunities. Private companies will go to institutional investors first because it's cheaper and easier to administer. So private companies and funds that solicit capital from retail investors will disproportionately be those that are unable to obtain financing from institutional investors. Fifth and finally, private market investors face greater fraud risks than in the public market. And retail investors, as, security state, as state security regulators can attest, may have little to no recourse. I urge you not to further expand the private markets and condition all exemptions upon the timely provision of essential information to all investors. I look forward to our discussion this morning and to your questions. Thank you. 
I thank you, Professor Fletcher. Uh, we will now move from our witnesses to member questioning, and I recognize myself for five minutes. Mr. Uh, Velasquez, <clears throat> it is no secret that SEC Chairman Gary Gensler's agenda includes sweeping new regulations in our private markets that would create barriers for investors and entrepreneurs to participate in those markets. According to the SEC's rulemaking agenda, the chairman intends to amend the accredited investor definition by increasing the annual income and net worth thresholds. Accredited investors are a vital source, as we have heard here from the testimony, of capital for small businesses and communities across the country. And changes that would shrink the pool of accredited investors would have a detrimental effect on capital formation. Can you please discuss, sir, the impact of raising the financial thresholds in the accredited investor definition and what that would mean for investors and businesses seeking to raise capital in our private markets? Chair sure, Wagner, thank you for the for the question. This is one of the fundamental issues that we have with the, the rule as written. Uh, the income requirements were written back in, what, 1980, 82? Um, probably randomly, right? Kind of finger to the wind, and let's pick some income thresholds. The ACA has conducted an analysis. 16,000 accredited investors make up the organization. That is the world's largest association of accredited investors. If those income thresholds go up, we would lose anywhere between 60 to 70 percent of our members. That means Kansas City, Houston, Boise. This is where angels live. Lubbock, Texas, Clay Como, Missouri. This is where the angel community is activated and mobilizing capital. Now, when you look at the membership of the organization, it is predominantly male and white. Now, over time, it has changed to include more women, but we still lack the diverse membership. We are at about 5% at most between black and brown investors combined of the, of the organization. That means that you would absolutely decimate, decimate the investor class for black and brown investors that are forming in Atlanta, Miami, Baltimore, Chicago. This would absolutely annihilate Angeles investors. So you know, if you increase that threshold, what you are effectively doing is telling not only the current investors that are there, but any future ones, this is a completely unattainable. Thank you, Mr. Velasquez. Um, Ms. Schulp, closed-end funds are strictly regulated and professionally managed investment vehicles that can invest in private markets that many retail investors currently cannot access. However, the SEC's limitations on a closed-end funds investment in private funds are so stringent that they effectively deny retail investors access to private markets. Can you discuss some of the investor protection mechanisms in place for closed-end funds? And based on your experience, would allowing closed-end funds to invest more than 15% of their assets in private securities increase retail investor exposure to our private markets while maintaining investor protections? Thank you. Closed-end funds are regulated under the Investment Company Act and are run by registered investment advisors, subject to the host of many, many regulations around both their public access to the markets as well as the managerial responsibilities of the managers of those funds. Those should be sufficient and are very important in maintaining access um, to the public markets. Allowing additional access to private equity in those such closed-end funds makes a lot of sense because you have additional layers of protection that you do not have in some of the private equity funds or other funds that are offered through the exemption process. Uh, investors, uh, public investors, your standard retail investors should have the opportunity to have more access, not 15% in a closed-end fund, Absolutely. not trying to invest in a company that does public equity investments as an indirect way to access that type of exposure. I think it makes a lot of sense to allow more. Thank you. And let me there. move quickly, Ms. Schulp, to the gig workers. As I said, they make up over a quarter of our U.S. workforce. Do you think they should have access to equity compensation so they can participate in the, the growth of companies that they help make successful? Uh, I, I brief do. Time. I would say to the extent that it, gig workers are making up more and more of our workforce, they should have the same opportunities here as regular salaried workers do. 
Absolutely, thank you. Uh, next, we shall move on to, at the ranking member's request, a gentleman from California, Mr. Vargas, now recognized for five minutes. Well, thank you very much. First of all, I'd like to say how pleased I am that we have a wonderful chair. Uh, I don't want to ruin your reputation, but <laughs> I appreciate all the kindnesses you've shown me and others through the years. <laughs> and it's great to see you there. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, I, again, I want to thank you for holding this here, and I want to thank all the witnesses here. Uh, obviously, there's a difference of opinion uh, among our witnesses today, and, and certainly I think my uh, opinion falls more where uh, Professor uh, Fletcher's opinion is. Uh, Professor Fletcher, um, you know, I, I, I think you said it well, you know, that we have to look at transparency and protection, and you are um, you're certainly your, your view of the uh, public markets versus the private markets is rather stark. Um, could you comment a little bit more on that? Because I, I think it is important to get that definition out uh, where the protections lie and where the protections don't. I mean, I think, to be fair, the other side, they're saying, you know, a lot of the opportunities are on the private side, and people do not get that opportunity unless they're an accredited investor. The other thing, and I'll ask later on to the people, I mean, it, it is interesting. I looked up the rule, Rule 501 of Regulation D, and it turns out, of course, that other nations have accredited investors also. We're not the only nation that has accredited investors. There's definitions, and the definitions lie all over the place. New Zealand has one, Canada, um, the, the EU. But, but anyway, I would ask first uh, you, Professor Fletcher, the issue of the protections that they have or don't have. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Congressman. So just to start, one of the starkest uh, distinctions between the private and the public market is the lack of information. So within the public markets, uh, public offerings, you have to do quite a bit of disclosure. You have to provide basic audited financial statements, and you have to make periodic disclosures. Within the private markets, there are no such uh, obligations to provide information to your investors, no matter how large the offering, um, provided that the offering is only made to accredited investors. So this has a few follow-on consequences. One is the inability to value these investments fairly or, or accurately uh, because we have to depend on insiders' valuations because we can't just look them up, nor are they providing us with the information to be able to make these valuations. The second problem that arises is a lack of liquidity within the private markets. If someone can't value what they own, then it's harder to sell it to someone else because how else are we going to know what that is worth? And so this lack of liquidity um, might be okay for some institutional investors, but we have to think about average retail investors investors who might have face a medical emergency or might face some other uh, need for their capital or some return on their investment, and they're not able to get their money out of that investment. And we see that time and time again in the private markets. Not, not to be the devil's advocate here, but we still have all the fraud statues. And there are, of course, very active uh, bars that do uh, take on these corporations that uh, commit fraud. So I mean, isn't there some protection there by being able to sue? Uh, unfortunately, Congressman, the fraud protections in the private market are significantly weaker than the fraud protections that we have in the public market. Uh, part of this goes to, again, this lack of information that we have because we kind of just don't know. Um, and that also, it also goes to the fact that the, the way in which fraud is treated or um, uh, uh, can be, uh, you can be held liable for fraud in the private markets differs significantly from what we have in the public markets. Okay, I do want to give the other side an opportunity to, to answer that question, the same question, you know, the protections. Uh, anyone like to take a shot? Go ahead. Go ahead, Mr. Uh, so a couple things. So over the last 40 years, the angel activity mm -hmm. has become more professionalized, thanks in large part to organizations like the ACA. Um, so in evaluating private opportunities, it's a pretty rigorous process. You go from screening to presentations to due diligence. And the interesting thing about doing this as an angel is that you're doing it in a group. <clears throat> you're doing it in a group with other folks who have a vested interest in ensuring that that opportunity is as vetted as, as, it, as possible. Why? Because you want to do good deals. And you don't want to pass along bad deals. You don't want to be known as the organization sharing bad deals. So you are known for doing rigor and doing due diligence on those, on those companies. So you request that information as part of the process. Now, in the ACA, we've evaluated thousands and thousands of deals. We've looked at, at we've talked to, surveyed the, the angel groups, surveyed the members. 
We don't find fraud. We find bad deals that fail, and it's a high-risk asset class, and that needs to be uh, you know, addressed, that when you are going to be involved in this asset class, it is a high risk with potential high upside. So as you embark on this, be aware of these red flags that could lead you in the wrong direction. But as far as fraud, we don't see fraud. We see bad deals. Thank you. My time is up. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. The, the gentleman uh, from Michigan, Mr. Heisinga, who is also the chair of the Subcommittee on Oversight and Investigations, is now recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, I, I might note, congratulations. This is the uh, committee that I was the former ranker and chair of. And uh, I see the glee in my colleagues' eyes that you are now chair rather than me. Uh, <laughs> The, no glee. I do have, uh, Madam Chair, I do request unanimous consent to enter into the record a letter uh, from the U.S. Chamber of Commerce on this issue. Without objection. Uh, thank you. And um, I got to tell you, thank you for being here. You are the voices and the faces and the stories that many of us on this side of the aisle have been talking about for years that have been dismissed by those on the other side and certainly by the chair of the SEC. Now, the professor wants to talk about the SEC, and I believe in her written statement, uh, it was allowing retail investors to access the private market simply increases the likelihood that everyday investors will be worse off from investing in unproven opaque, opaque investments with limited liquidity and no information to value their investments. I might uh, add, uh, professor, that if Chair Gensler has his way, it's going to be even more expensive for retail investors to invest. Um, and frankly, it simply sounds like you would rather ban private markets uh, than anything else. So um, I, I, I'm going I'm to turn to my, uh, to my friend David. Actually, uh, David uh, and I have known each other going back to my time when I was in the state legislature. We've lost contact over a number of years, so he will take this question uh, in the, uh, in the uh, spirit of which I'm asking it. David, are you a sucker? <laughs> are, 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 are you smart enough to really do this, even when you weren't a qualified investor? I'm not a sucker, Congressman. Uh, that, that I know. And I can guarantee you, Ms. Bell ain't no sucker. Uh, and, and Mr. Velasquez, same thing. Um, you, you are the stories that have made America what it is, this entrepreneurial juggernaut that we are. And I don't, I, I just about said something I, that would have been bleeped. I don't care <laughs> what other countries' uh, in qualified investor uh, uh, thresholds are. I care about U.S. thresholds. And, uh, Professor, one thing that you, uh, or I'm sorry, Ms. Shoup, one of the things that you did say is that you look, the wealthy coasts dominate this. And those of us from flyover country, guess what? $175,000 in Kalamazoo, Michigan, or El Paso, or down in Ohio, or at, even in, in, in Notre Dame at South Bend, that's very different than $175,000 in New York City or in L.A. And, and the fact that government can't recognize that is just baffling. And this discussion of increasing this is just ludicrous. So last Congress, I introduced the Accredited Investor Definition Review Act, which among other things would require the SEC to review a list of qualifications, designations, credentials for individuals to qualify as a, as a qualified investor. And I, that is the direction we need to go. And uh, Mr. Velasquez, I really appreciate your very helpful enumerated ways that we can move forward on this. And um, I, 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 I want to get a little reaction, and I'll start with you, Ms. Bell. You know, from what you were hearing, a very academic view of, of how people are going to be disadvantaged, and, and I'm curious if you could re, re, uh, respond to a statement about this is going to amplify wealth inequity and that this is a greater fraud risk. Do you think this is going to amplify uh, wealth inequity? I think it's going to provide, um, I keep forgetting about this. No, you're good. I think it's going to provide more opportunities for wealth. Um, you know, when I think about the founders that we serve, um, give an example of a story yesterday, I met a woman named Isla Watson. She's the founder of Squad. And she talked about, she thought she matched the pattern, right? She graduated from MIT. She's a data scientist. Um, but as she went out to raise, she went through about 300 pitches before she finally landed some capital. But what she decided to do was just go back home and raise from her church. 
And these were physicians, lawyers, working class families that she raised from. And so when we don't diversify the access, we're also holding back people who understand us. It's almost like when you think about the reason that we need diversity in healthcare is we need more diverse doctors who understand more diverse people. It's the same thing with investing. We need more people with diverse mindsets who understand how black and brown people spend their money and what we think about risk and how what our risk tolerance level is based off of who we are. I think that's the chance that I didn't get, right? That, no. that no one, you don't understand what my risk tolerance is. Um, and it might be different than your neighbor. And it might be. But I need the opportunity to be able to express To be able to show. make that judgment. Yeah. Yes. And I, and I know my time is up, and I kind of picked on Mr. Uh, Olivencia. Uh, but uh, uh, if, if you could maybe wrap it up and, and your thoughts on that. I would j just simply, I would say it goes back to um, what uh, uh, Eli Velasquez said I'm about I'm sorry. The groups. gentleman's time has, has expired. Um, um, if you could submit it in writing, I'd so appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Uh, I, and, but, uh, Madam Chair, thank you. And I appreciate you being here and sharing your stories. And I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Kasten, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank no. you. I was going down the aisle. I, I apologize. Uh, the, the ranking member, uh, Mr. Sherman from California, is now recognized for five minutes. Everyone in the audience should know you will get to hear from Mr. Kasten soon. It will be <laughs> very interesting. Um, uh, Professor F uh, Fletcher is right in the extent that obviously the best investor protection is when you have the liquidity of the publicly registered company, you get audited financial statements, the statements not only good, they not just an audit, but also a PCAOB review and a, uh, uh, an audit of the internal control system. The only problem with that is that it's millions of dollars to provide all that. And that doesn't count the millions of dollars that are then spent by the investment analyst industry if you want to buy Apple or Disney, you're sitting on top of an information system, an information checking system that involves hundreds of billions, uh, millions of dollars together with all of the, the analysts on Wall Street. Now, one could talk and say, well, let's close off the private markets uh, to everything other than, than big companies. Uh, the private markets are much bigger than someone who focuses on securities regulation would realize because we, we, we used to like, oh, you're doing a Regulation D and there are 15 people in the room or uh, 300 people and they're all getting stock certificates. Every pizzeria is a guy with a brother-in-law who put up money for the, every four-unit apartment building is a couple of dentists and there are a lot more pizzerias and apartment buildings than there are uh, uh, these, these offerings uh, that we're talking, that we tend to focus on here. So we need a system where we determine, you know, at least the pizzerias and the apartment buildings, et cetera, are going to be illiquid. They're not going to be audited financial statements, et cetera, et cetera, and people are able to, to make their investments. Um, are we going to uh, then allow that to be in, in private uh, companies? Uh, there, as long as we have a regulation D that focuses on wealth, it's very hard to justify that we don't index that for inflation. If Ronald Reagan's people were right that it should be a million dollars then, then it should be three and a half million dollars now. But many of our witnesses have said that wealth shouldn't be a barrier. It seems unfair and it seems illogical. Um, so the focus here is on sophistication of either the investor, well it's unfair to say that you can't invest if you don't have an MBA, or uh, the investment advisor who's truly independent. Um, uh, uh, Mr. Alvesia, uh, uh, you're no sucker. We've established that. <laughs> <laughs> but what standards should we have? I mean, do we include all the CPAs and attorneys? What about CFPAs? Should there be a separate? Uh, I, and, we're, and we're licensing somebody to advise on everything from a soup company to a nut company. So is there any... Uh, is there any particular standard for what is a sophisticated investor? Sure. Thank, thank you, uh, ranking or, member. Or sophisticated advisor. Thank you, ranking member Sherman. Um, I think there's a, there's a couple of things that were mentioned. A lot of them recommendations from the, the Angel Capital Association. One, I think the licenses were a great great um, start, uh, but also education. Right? We we have uh, MBAs out there. You can have. I had an MBA and I still wasn't accredited. I had all the knowledge from a leading university. So um, education education. I'm not sure Larry Summers would qualify. <laughs> 
Um, the, I, well, I mean, under the standards we have now. That's not, that's not a dig at Summers. That's a dig at the standards. Understand. Understand. Um, I think ex examinations are another one, and that could be done through the Angel Capital Association. Uh, Self-certifications. Um, and should we have different standards for whether you're a sophisticated investor or whether you're a, an advisor capable of making somebody else qualify? The advisor side is something new, I'm, and I'm not... Um, I don't, that one, there'd probably need a lot of safeguards around that one. You, well, you, you touched on some you, of your you remarks. You certainly need you. independent safeguards. Correct. And I realize it's not enough to have a fiduciary standard. You also have to have uh, no commissions and no referrals. So it's got to be my person who's advising me, not the promoter's person who's advising me and then gets a, a referral and advises the next investor and, 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 the, and the next investor. How do you police that as well would be would be well with all with all of these if if you violate regulation D you uh, you have a uh, an illegal offering uh, you're liable for uh, whatever people lose in the investment uh, etc plus uh, I think there are criminal penalties um, so uh, and then finally uh, uh, is there anybody here who thinks that in, that anybody should be allowed assuming they don't own the company but it, or work in the company every day. But if you're an outside investor, should be able to invest more than 10% of their net worth in one of these. Raise your hands if you think that we allow more than 10% of the net worth from the investor. We see one hand. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. Next, I'd like to recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Session, for Madam five Chair, minutes. Madam Chairwoman, thank you very much. Uh, each of you have uh, presented yourself today, and we appreciate it. Uh, you will soon learn that I... Uh, align myself much with Mr. Heisinga's uh, proactive viewpoint of why we're here today. We're here to determine whether we should uh, change uh, rules, regulations, and add in some, uh, some new ideas. So, Mrs. Sloop, I want to, before I ask this question, I want you to know I'm going to be coming to you, and want to give you the vast num uh, amount of time to respond, uh, but I believe that there are ways for us to expand the accredited investor definition. That's what we're here today. That's what we're zeroing in on. And I believe that we recognize that there can be some limitations, but opening it up, I think, would be an advantage. Can you spend a little bit more time? You've got four minutes to give us an idea. How should we be thinking about this? Perhaps both sides of the equation, but overwhelmingly, I believe we should expand it in legislation that we change. Thank you. Um, I agree. I think that there are a lot of opportunities here for expanding access for investors that will also bring windfalls to entrepreneurs who are also seeking. Is that capital. money? Uh, That's advantage, isn't it's it? Advantage for entrepreneurs, but it's advantage for investors. And I'll say the Angel Capital Association is very able to speak to this. That it is. Also sharing of knowledge where serial entrepreneurs who might not meet the wealth standards at this point are interested in sharing both their capital and their abilities with new entrepreneurs looking to start businesses. But back to the, the general question as to what we should do here, I think that any sort of incremental change is for the better. Um, but taking a look at the broader question, I think that the ideal solution, which does not get into these line drawing questions about the SEC making a decision of whether or not an individual is sophisticated, is to look at the option of self-certification coupled with some sort of short form disclosure to investors about the risks of investing in private markets. Um, there are unique risks here and there are different risks in the public markets, and it's important for investors to understand that. But giving investors the option and the power in their own hands to make the decision as to whether or not they want to take on those risks is the best option. There are a lot of other options, though. Um, these educational, educational qualifications are good things to take a look at. By the way, you're speaking of advantages, not just options. I, they are advantages. Um, but I think what's important is that when we think about it, it, we don't necessarily think about it in terms of advantage as well. Because some people will make investments, and those investments will not pan out. 
and they might not ultimately see it as an advantage at the end of the day. But the fact that they had the option to make that choice is itself the advantage. Um, the idea of allowing some sort of test for accredited investors to qualify is, is an interesting one. I'm concerned about kind of leaving the SEC to designing what that test would look like and throwing up barriers that make it impossible to allow people to prove to the agency their sophistication. So I think this is part of the development of capitalism. We could all have our own ideas about this, but by the time someone has something to invest, they generally speaking have been in a marketplace of capitalism. Uh, and I think that this is the in allowing them that enrichment. I don't mean in making money, I'm saying to participate, as opposed to closing it off and having government control what they do. I take what you've said as uh, a, a good start, incrementalism you talked about. You didn't talk about kicking the door open. But I think that our young chairwoman should listen to this, and this committee, subcommittee, should be very open to knowing that our country, IPOs, new ideas, uh, investment opportunity, should be open to all. And there's no certainty of anything we do but I think opportunity is the key. I want to thank the gentlewoman, Madam Chairwoman, I yield back my time. I, I thank the gentleman. Uh, and now, now it is my supreme pleasure uh, to recognize uh, the, the member of the minority who was the first to arrive to this hearing, let me just say, uh, the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Caston for five minutes for his questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm pleased to offer the moment that Mr. Sherman has been waiting for all day. Um, <laughs> the, uh, um, really appreciate you all being here. Um, I, I want to start just with a quick question for you, Michelle, because I think we agree, but I just want to confirm. Would you support financial regulations that would impose on our private companies the same accounting and public disclosure obligations we put on public companies? Just a quick yes or no? No. Oh, good. I <laughs> share that view. I, I, I ask that question, um, and, and I, I hope we all in this room agree on that, because after we had John Ray come and testify about FTX, I met with one of the um, larger, very well-known institutional investors who lost a lot of money, who was keen to tell me all the red flags they saw, and this was after we learned that they were using QuickBooks um, uh, for their accounting standard. For those of you, I know some of us privately may use QuickBooks for our checking account. Um, for all the people watching us on television, that does not pass the test of an audited financial report. Um, and, and I asked them, how did you possibly make this investment? I used to run a private equity-backed company. I am not familiar with accessing millions of dollars and not having smart 20-somethings crawling all over my accountants. I said, how did you possibly make this investment? And they said, well, frankly, we kind of assumed Sequoia had done all the diligence ahead of us. Now, I'm not going to name them because I don't want to hurt their next fundraise, but this was a sophisticated investor, right? And, and, and if we agree that we don't want to put the public obligations that are out there, then I guess, I guess I'm left, and I want to turn to you, Ms. Fletcher. If we reduced the standard of sophisticated investors, below the level that is already getting some pretty dumb things being done by these so-called sophisticated investors who lost tens of millions of dollars, um, would that have imposed more or less accountability on the leadership of FTX? So just so I understand, if we reduced the level, would it yes. have imposed more accountability? Yes. The answer is no. Yeah. Um, uh, so, you know, the congressman earlier said, I wanted to ban private markets, and that is furthest from the truth. What I want is information in the private markets. The private markets currently lack all information. We are dependent on private funds, on uh, private companies to provide some information when they deem it, when they feel like it, and to whomever they feel like it. And like you've noted, uh, with FTX, we saw how the most sophisticated investors that we have in our capital markets were 
duped. No one likes to think of themselves as a sucker, uh, which has also been established. None of us think we are a sucker. However, what we see with cases like FTX, with cases like Theranos, we see that there are time and time again, sophisticated investors are unable to properly uh, view all the risks or appreciate all the risks because they either assume someone else has done the due diligence or they assume if you're raising $2 billion, of course, this must be uh, good enough. And that isn't good enough. And that's what's going to um, uh, aff afflict our retail investors if we open up the, the definition in that way. Yeah, I also, I also just want to emphasize Mr. Sherman's point because one of the other points that this investor made to me was that he said, look, you've got to understand the venture space. We lose money on nine of our 10 investments and we hope to make it up on the 10th, which means that you have to be in a position to lose 90% of your, of your seed capital. And if we don't have some threshold there, you know, we're going to blow up. Um, can, can you... Um, well, I guess let me ask a dumb question, Ms. Fletcher, because I think we know the answer to this, but l assume the worst of me. Assume I am a, a, a Ponzi scheme operator who is constantly thirsty for dumb money. Would I be supportive of the proposals that the majority is putting out to reduce the standards <laughs> right now? I, I feel like you've walked me in there, uh, Congressman, but yes, yes, you would be. Uh, Self-certification is, uh, you know, that's one of the fastest way to get some dumb money. Um, actually, uh, Matt Levine wrote a column yesterday in which he talked about uh, the self-certification option, and he did so in a very extreme and joking manner. Uh, however, if we take a look at what Matt Levine has to say, he says, basically, you're self-certifying, yes, I am dumb, and yes, I want to lose all my money. Money. And yes, I'm saying that I will have no recourse. And that is really kind of what we're leaving everyone, uh, retail investors, up to if that is the path that we decide to take. So with the little time, can you just speculate, if you would, what would happen to private wealth in this country if we allowed unethical Ponzi scheme seekers like me <laughs> access to that? You, you would capital. have Ponzi unethical, well, I don't want to call the congressman unethical. <laughs> uh, in the hypothetical that you have posed, Congressman, uh, these Ponzi scheme uh, seekers would be the ones that profit at the expense of retail investors, at the expense of the private wealth uh, in our country, in our, in our economy. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. It's now my pleasure for the chair to, to recognize the gentleman from Arkansas, Mr. Hill, who's also the chair of the Subcommittee on Digital Assets and the vice chair of our full Committee on Financial Services. You're recognized, sir, for five minutes. Well, I, thank you, Chair. And I want to say what a pleasure it is to have you as our chair. You come from the heartland of our country, and you have worked in the vineyards of capital markets policy for years here on the House Financial Services Committee, and I think it's a special privilege to see you as the first woman to chair this uh, subcommittee in the history of, uh, of Congress. I think that's an accomplishment, and I think your work as Vice Chairman on the Foreign Affairs Committee and a former ambassador for the United States gives you that global perspective that is so critical when we make judgments about uh, capital formation and American competitiveness. So. I'm grateful you're my chair. Um, we are gathered today to talk about uh, barriers to greater opportunities for more people. That's the theme here. I appreciate my friend Mr. Kasten's uh, overviews and concerns, and I think they absolutely are true, and I think they're shared by everybody on this committee about how to do this in the right way. The idea of an accredited investor is supposed to limit certain investments to only those investors who are considered by this statute that hasn't been updated in 40 years, sophisticated enough to understand the risks. So we're taking a look at something that really hadn't been looked at in detail uh, since I was a staffer on the banking committee 40 years ago. The SEC's outdated regulations only use arbitrary thresholds like income and net worth to shut people out of investment opportunities that in turn could help them build wealth, have, wealth, have financial security, and an expanded future set of opportunities. And in my view, this is to the detriment of many Americans, but most of all, those with knowledge, but modest income or modest net worth. Denying access to opportunity and limiting social economic mobility for that group creates a vicious cycle where hardworking Americans with knowledge, with capability, uh, but not the statutory definitions from 40 years ago are left behind. So I think it's time for us to reevaluate the definition of an accredited investor and ensure that it serves its intended purpose of protecting investors, but rather than excluding them. And what frustrates me is something that the SEC can, this is something the commission can do without any act by Congress. Let me quote the 1933 act. 
Any person who on the basis of such factors as financial sophistication, net worth, knowledge, knowledge and experience in financial matters or amount of assets under management qualifies as an accredited investor. Qualifies, Madam Chair, as an accredited investor under the rules and regulations which the commission shall prescribe. So uh, 40 years ago, we ticked off certainly net worth uh, and uh, to use that as a definition for financial sophistication. But as we all know, Chair Gensler is too busy uh, to try to change the SEC into the Securities and Environment Commission rather than its capital formation and investor protection role. And therefore, he's not focused on this infor very important issue, so I'm glad uh, we are. We need to have uh, and a democratized approach to this to benefit more people. And in that regard, I've introduced the Fair Investment Opportunities for Professional Experts Act, which would expand the accredited investor definition to include people with securities licenses and securities uh, experience, but also uh, qualifying education or job experience. And this is directly related to my work for years uh, in uh, Reg D, in investing and as a banker. Uh, we saw people who invented a new technology, who put up and raised the funds, created the board, and yet they couldn't invest personally because they were not accredited investor and their team couldn't. In my view, that's not right. So, uh, Madam Chair, I'd like to ask unanimous consent to assert a record uh, uh, in the record, the SEC's Office of Advocate for Small Business Capital Formation annual report into the record. Without objection. I'd also like to insert a statement from Tani Chambers, founder and CEO of RAVN in the record. Ms. Bell, would you agree that uh, this makes the case for expanding accredited and definition that could help bring uh, a broader group of people into that startup ecosystem and, and have a better shot at, at wealth? I think so. I mean, I think it's, mm. thank you. <laughs> I think so. I think it's important to not focus on deregulation, but focus on de-risking. Um, what could happen? What could we be doing to provide information, education, um, the due diligence process, there is one. And so when you are getting into investments, it's not a complete lack of information. So I would say that, yes, it's an opportunity to provide more people with an opportunity. Thank you. And I appreciate the chair and congratulations again for leading this Congress. Now yield back. I thank the gentleman for his very kind words. Uh, gentleman yields back. And now I will recognize a gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Nickel. Welcome to the committee, sir. You're now recognized for five minutes. Th thank you so much, Madam Chair, um, and thank you so much to our witnesses for taking the time to be with us today. I want to uh, especially acknowledge uh, Professor Fletcher from the great state of North Carolina. Thank you for being with us today. Um, ensuring people of color, women and veterans have access to capital is a priority for me. Minority-owned businesses are critical for our economy. I welcome the efforts by our chair in this subcommittee to enhance capital formation and remove roadblocks to ensure entrepreneurs with good ideas can have access to the support and resources they need to be successful. At the same time, we need to ensure that consumers and new investors are properly protected. Some of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle have put forth proposals to change the requirements to qualify as an accredited investor. I welcome this conversation. One example of this would be to include individuals that pass an exam established and administered by the SEC. I believe at a minimum this exam should ensure investors have the ability to recognize conflicts of interest of broker dealers and investment advisors who market investment products and ability by investors to comprehend and, under and use financial statements to make investment decisions. Professor Fletcher, um, what are your recommendations to ensure that a test like this is as robust as possible? Uh, thank you, Congressman, uh, for that question. Um, so I think in addition to um, the things that you mentioned would be uh, particularly important in a test uh, such as that uh, to have the ability to understand the risks and to be able to read certain financial statements. I also think some form of continuing education, uh, some form of uh, recertification after a number of years. But I do want to also highlight the point that I've been driving home quite a bit here, which is that even with such tests and certifications and licensing, we do still have to address the problem of, of the absence of information within the private markets. And so 
yes information, um, yes licensing to understand, to be able to sure, to be certain that our investors understand things is important. Education is important, but also just the very fact of having that information to value these Im investments is also important. Well, th thank you for your answer. Um, I, I hope that both parties can work together to ensure that minorities have access to the capital they need while also protecting working families and look forward to continued work by this subcommittee. I yield back. I thank the gentleman for yielding back. It's now my pleasure for the chair to recognize the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Muser. We want to say first, welcome to the Financial Services Committee and to the Capital Markets Committee. You are now recognized for five minutes. Well, thank you, Chairwoman, very, very much uh, uh, for being on the Financial Service Committee, but especially for being on your uh, subcommittee. Uh, thank, thank you to uh, all of the witnesses. Um, so 13% of American households qualify under uh, this uh, accreditation uh, standard, right, in, in investment. Uh, that's the information we have. So is there one particular provision? I want to ask about what reforms you recommend, and you offered some of those in your, in your openings, but is there one particular provision? Is it, is it the level of income? Uh, what is there, uh, Ms. Bell, let me ask you, is there one particular provision that disqualifies uh, most from being accredited investors? Yeah, well, let me make sure. Thank you, let me make sure I understand your question. You're asking, does this one, does, is there a provision yeah. that I favor uh, out of the ones that are being presented? Yeah, that, would, that okay. would make the biggest difference. I believe the one that is uh, expanding the definition uh, where you can use your job and use your uh, actual work experience to qualify, um, that would be most aligned with the experience that I've had, where I have had uh, access to thousands of founders, but still could not qualify because of income. Would, would you work that out? perhaps on a percentage basis of what their income is, or, or would you just say uh, that should be qualify for any level of investment? That's a good question. Yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah. And, and my, other, my other question is this, what about borrowing? Can they borrow in order to invest? Are you asking for a reform that would permit that? Well, I think having investments um, that you can make that are de-risked to test Right, I think we've acknowledged that uh, th if you make an investment, there's going to be some risk. Yeah. Um, and so being able sure. to make investments at a certain level that makes sense for your income would make the most sense for beginning to walk you into the process. Uh, do your investors receive some sort of accountant reviewed financial statement, uh, Mr. Valencia? Uh, yes, we do, and it goes back to the information. So a key, a key point that I want to reemphasize is investing in groups whether it's Anhelis Investors, Commune Angels out of Detroit, we invest in groups. We do receive information. And that would and exist I, whether they're accredited or not. I mean, right? It, well, it exists. You may not have access to it if you're not accredited, right? Okay. So the informa you get special rights to information. Um, but I would say for me, the, I mean, I, I started my angel investing career 10 years ago. I, I, and I'm an executive at a, I was an executive at a Fortune 100. I barely made that. So I think the, I think everybody in here in general thought it shouldn't be more than 10%, but I think the the, um, the annual salary, yeah. I think if you drop that, maybe 50,000, you open it up to a lot more people who have the right education, certifications, et cetera. What are your losses, bad debt, on a regular basis within your investment portfolio mm. on an annual basis? I've invested in about 70. Um, I have two that have been marked up to more than a billion in valuation. I have about 10 that are about a, over 100 billion in valuation. Of the 70, about seven or eight have, have I've lost everything. Okay, so less than 10% of the, of the aggregate as well, of the overall investment, not just the number of losses? Right. Okay. Ms. Bell, what about yourself? Would you mind? With us, we're a nonprofit, and so our capital is grant capital. Uh, Mr. Vasquez, what percentage of so bad debt or losses do you Remember, see? I started investing two years ago, okay. so I'm... I'm a baby angel, <laughs> I'm a baby. so we have the, we don't even have the ability to. So we just made those early investments. Okay, all right. So so that sounds like it's positive though. It's, I hope so. It, you're still there, <laughs> so it's, that's a good sign. All right. So let let me ask uh, Ms. Shope then. What changes reforms? I know you you mentioned some. We, we, so we're primarily talking about the level of income of a of a household of an individual of a of a uh, spouses. What other reforms? would make sense to expand the number of people that can be accredited investors? 
I think there's a lot of different ways to do it that aren't these kind of bright line tests of wealth and income. Yeah. Um, and I think that you start to run into difficulties as well when we talk about work experience um, where you say, well, someone that's got an MBA must know what they're doing. Uh, but that would exclude the entrepreneur who started Absolutely. an online company out of their home and, and was unable to prove those types of credentials. Um, an exam gets rid of some of those problems, but you don't want to have the exam be so difficult. And I'm to just have about access. out of time. Th yeah. Thank you. And if I could get afterwards in writing, how do you find your your investors? They come to you. Or do you go to them? I'm uh, out of time, Madam Chair. I yield back. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen, for yielding back. It's now my pleasure to recognize the gentlewoman from California, Ms. Waters, the ranking member of the full committee. Ma'am, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you so very much, Ms. Wagner. Uh, you look good in that seat. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I hope you don't have it for too long, though. <laughs> All right, Chair Wagner, before I begin my qu questions, I'd like to ask unanimous consent to submit a report for the hearing record that was released by North American Securities Administrators Association entitled Report and Recommendations for Reinvigorating Our Capital Markets. Without objection. Thank you. I'm going to direct my question to Professor Fletcher. You state in your testimony that expanding securities law exemptions, particularly the exemptions for accredited investors, fundamentally weakens protections for retail investors. <clears throat> I recognize that the current definition of an accredited investor is too heavily focused on income and wealth as an indication of financial sophistication. Having money certainly does mean that you are savvy with it. However, I'm also concerned that if we effectively open up the high-risk securities market to retail investors, they may become prey to unscrupulous financial intermediaries who may also have conflicts of interest and be all too willing to recommend terrible products. Could you please elaborate on the risk to retail investors when they are marketed unregulated and unregistered securities? Uh, thank you, Congresswoman. Um, yes, so within the private markets, if we open up access to private uh, offerings to uh, our retail investors, what we can expect is that there is no information requirements within the private markets, nothing uh, along the lines of what we have within the public markets of disclosures, of um, financial uh, statement requirements. Uh, my esteemed panelists have talked about within their own organizations, they are able to get information. However, they're acting as a group, right? And they don't face collective action problems that we would expect our retail investors to face in trying to get that information from, um, from private funds or from uh, private companies. And and so there will be that lack of information. And that lack of information will have certain uh, follow-on consequences for our retail investors, uh, including a lack of liquidity um, and a lack of an ability to value the company. We've seen many of these examples, uh, the lack of liquidity. We saw that with the Blackstone, uh, Blackstone's Real Estate Investment Trust, which uh, has a uh, prevented its investors from redeeming uh, their shares. And we've also seen the lack of valuation, um, accurate valuations when we think about FTX um, and how that valuation ballooned from eight billion to 32 billion within two years um, and with no one being able to kind of check what that valuation was. We can expect much of the same and worse for our retail investors. To illustrate the risk, could you give specific examples where institutional investors, despite their supposed uh, sophistication, are still victims of fraud and abuse? The collapse of FTX, as well as the subprime mortgage crisis, are two that come to mind. Let me just say, ladies and gentlemen, um, you know, this issue is being revisited. We have dealt with this before. I did not realize that the information was not available in the way that you just described it. I, I don't think anybody would be against them having the same kind of information that's required in other ways. So what are some examples? 
Um, so you've highlighted two of the most prominent examples with FTX and the global financial um, crisis, uh, but we also have other examples with uh, Theranos, right? So Theranos, um, which uh, has been um, a part of a massive uh, fraud scandal now, that also was a company that was in the private markets that raised billions of dollars and was able to do so despite uh, there being uh, what we now know to be that the product that was being offered was not um, uh, was not valuable in any way. Um, and so when it comes to this question of information, as you've uh, mentioned, Congresswoman, one of the things to note here is that in the private markets, uh, private offerings can discriminate within their investors as to what information to offer and to whom and to when um, and at what level, right? And that is part of the, uh, the bigger issue, in my opinion, that we face if we allow retail investors to get into that space. Whereas uh, Ms. Schulp has said earlier that she wouldn't agree for the full level of disclosures that we have within the public markets to also be a part of the private markets, I do think that there's a lot of space in between what we have now and having public market disclosures be in the private markets. So it's not either all of the public market disclosures or none. There is some middle ground, and, and we do need to be thinking about what that middle ground can or should be. That's very important. I just. Um I yield back the balance of my time. I thank the gentlewoman and ranking member. It's now my pleasure uh, to welcome the gentleman from Iowa, Mr. Nunn, to Congress, to the Financial Services Committee, and to the Capital Markets Committee. The gentleman is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and it's a privilege getting to serve with this uh, august team, both of fellow freshmen and of uh, experienced senior leaders on this. Hey, thank you so much for the members of the committee today who um, uh, have gotten to hear our testimony from uh, the group in front of us. You each have incredible life stories. Um, I'm going to start, Ms. Bell, with you. You are an inspiration to my five young daughters, so hopefully they can follow in the incredible lead that you've led. You know, uh, your organization, Black Girls Venture, it provides uh, minority female uh, founders access to a network in order to attract capital from around the country. One of the economic issues that have arisen over our country in the last two decades is really that the concentration of venture capital and early stage investing has largely only supported certain parts of the country. While there's been some modest growth in this type of investment outside our two coasts, uh, most of the venture funding still goes to just three locations, California, Massachusetts, and New York. Now there's some good things that come out of New York, so that's fair. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> There's a lot that needs to be done to incentivize venture in Iowa and other states like Iowa that are rural areas where we have a lot of good opportunity, but one that certainly seems to help would be the expanding of the pool of potential investors into young and private businesses. So, Ms. Bell, in your view, how would you recommend we expand the addition of accredited investors to promote capital formation in parts of the country and in communities that have not benefited from such growth or funding over the last two decades? Thank you. I think that people want an opportunity to get in, right? We want to figure out what that means. And um, so when I think about how you would expand the definition, one of the ways I would consider is I do think 150K threshold could be more fair um, when we look at the percentage of the company, of the country that is able to get there, right? I think right now we're talking about who's there already, who's already at a certain level of wealth. But part of the conversation is who's trying to get there. Um, and as I've worked myself here, I don't want you to now move the, the needle again, and then I'm shut out again. I think there is a large pool of, of potential investors who are kind of waiting in the wings. A lot of the examples that we're talking about are not really including black people. <laughs> and they're not including the early stage companies by black and brown people. And that's because those black and brown people are not even, despite being the fastest growing entrepreneurial segment in the country, still receiving less than 1% of venture capital. So if we can open up and expand the definition and more people can get in, then more investment can go to black and brown founders. would absolutely agree with you on that, Ms. Bell. And I would also expand it to say, you know, um, folks across the country, a lot of diversity out there, a lot of great entrepreneurs ready to take up the mantle in the same way you have. I, I do want to ask where the government can be helpful here or where maybe the government needs to get out of your way and just let you do you. You know, one of the notions we hear is that the current SEC seems to embrace that private offerings are too risky and that most individuals aren't able to understand the risk and reward associated with such offerings. I think you and I both agree here that this vastly underestimates the intelligence and the financial sophistication of a lot of Americans who, as you know, may not be wealthy enough to be able to jump into this uh, as a qualified accreditation. So my ask here is, what in your view would be the best way to recommend to the SEC someone's financial sophistication regardless of their wealth? Great question, thank you. 
I think we have to think about like what other intermediaries could exist. So our particular organization would be considered an ecosystem builder, building organization, and an entrepreneur support organization. There's other entities in the country that may be able to help qualify, um, like organizations like ours, organizations like CDFIs, other financial institutions or people who are working with small businesses directly that would be able to help the investors also feel that the, like, the investments are de-risked. I think that's the key, right? Is like, is there a way to use to support and fund other intermediaries um, that the SEC would, SEC would govern, but don't have to be the SEC or don't have to SEC or don't have to be FINRA, right? That we're only talking about two when there's hundreds of ecosystem builder organizations out there that could get certified to be able to handle some of the the lift of what it would mean to define sophistication. Thank you, Ms. Bell. I can see why you have exceeded so well in the space. I really appreciate that. And with that, uh, Madam Chair, I would yield back the remainder of my time. I thank, I, I thank the gentleman for yielding back. We have to get used to this yielding back of time. I'm, I'm, <laughs> great, I'm grateful. It's now my pleasure to recognize a gentleman from New York, Mr. Meeks, who I've had the great pleasure of serving in both the Financial Services and Foreign Affairs Committee uh, for a number of years. Sir, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you all for your uh, testimony today. We, we have been paying very close attention to it in our offices as you've gone on and it's been tremendously uh, informative. Uh, and you know, I know that it's imperative that we work to level the playing field to create more opportunities for investors who are women and people of color. Access to pre-IPO investment opportunities should not be reserved just for the wealthy. Uh, and as we've heard uh, you say here today, it is also an enormous issue for the recipients of this capital because many entrepreneurs, especially those from black and brown communities, do not have access to the same pool of investors as their white counterparts, as you just indicated, Ms. Bell. This makes it more difficult for their businesses uh, to scale and perpetuates, perpetuates this cycle contributing to generational wealth gap, which is what I'm focused on closing. That said, it is of paramount importance that everyday Americans, particularly people of color, are not taken advantage of by predatory investment practices. The testimony presented here today, I believe, supports my belief that we are not doing a good job or a good enough job of expanding access to opportunities while ensuring that investors from all backgrounds enjoy strong investor protections. So I'll ask Ms. Fletcher first, what types of population is the current accredited investor definition intended to serve? And do you feel that by altering the definition or the thresholds, uh, we could bring more people of color into the field? Thank you, Congressman, for your question. Uh, so currently, our, AI, um, our accredited investor definition uh, targets people of a certain uh, uh, income threshold, and really what this does is that it exposes our senior citizens um, at the highest rate to the private markets, um, who are then taken advantage of uh, by these risky um, and extremely, uh, these extremely risky investments that sometimes prove to be fraudulent. Um, if we uh, tinker at the margins with the in, um, accredited investor definition, whether it by lowering it as some have suggested here today, yes, that will open up the pool, but then that doesn't change the risks and the issues that are existing in this market, which are namely the ones I've underscored so far this morning, including the lack of information within the market. The private uh, market offerings do not have information disclosure uh, obligations. Many of my co-panelists have pointed to the fact that they receive information as they determine whether or not to invest. They're acting as a body, as a pool. They're acting as a group. They're able to possibly demand more information than you would expect from the average retail investor that would be participating in this space if we were to lower the accredited investor definition to open it up for more black and brown folks. As more black and brown people enter that market without any kind of investor protection, what we can expect is more wealth extraction. We can expect a, a, a widening of the gap of um, uh, wealth inequality in this country in which the poor are being taken advantage of and they're preyed upon in these markets. And that is my deepest concern as well as we think about how we would expand these markets or whether to even expand them without any kind of backstop or protection um, um, as we think about that. Thank, thank, thank you very much. And, 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 and let me ask Ms. Bell, because I was really struck by uh, your testimony and your story of creating uh, black girl ventures. In fact, I know I referred uh, my niece 
to your website, you know, because that's what she's been very uh, interested in. It's a, a incredible story of success uh, by any measure, and um, and I appreciate that. I think that we see uh, eye to eye uh, about the need to strike a balance between, as just indicated, uh, access and consumer protection. Uh, and I believe that if we are talking about expanding access to people outside of the traditional investor set, then the need for clear, transparent and reliable disclosure is, is paramount. So I, I, I wondered if you might be able to share what kinds of disclosures you think are best suited for uh, interested investors who wouldn't qualify under today's definition, definition of an accredited definition. Thank you, and thank you for, for, for referring to these. Um, so traditionally, what happens is you go through due diligence, and in that, you're required to submit financial reports. Um, you also go through interviews um, with, with different members uh, if, if you have a group. I think the benefit of working with like a Black Girl Ventures is, suppose your niece, for example, she starts an amazing tech company, um, and we've helped her grow that. We gave her access to a grant. We helped her with the mentor. We helped her with um, all the information she needed to get to a certain place. What we would do is introduce the networks. I think a network effect is also maybe missing from this conversation. Like investing is a large, even if you're a retail investor, it's all network. Um, you get walked in to these different networks. And so you're not necessarily all alone uh, when you're investing. So you wanna have disclosed pro forma financial reports. You wanna actually get to know the person because you're also a partner. Thank you I'm sorry, the gentleman's time's expired. Uh, I'd now, uh, I'd like to, um, to mention to everyone, both witnesses and uh, members, please speak uh, clearly and loudly, just like Ms. Bell did, into the microphone. We're hearing that the streaming is having difficulty picking up um, some of the audio, so I thank you. Next, I would like to welcome the gentlewoman from Indiana, Mrs. Houchin. Welcome, ma'am, to Congress, to the Financial Services Committee, and to the Capital Markets Committee. Uh, it's so wonderful to have another woman, Republican, on this committee. You, may, you, may you walk in my footsteps. So Thank you so we're much. We're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm so proud of you uh, in, in this, uh, earning this position. It's well earned. And um, if I can follow in your footsteps, I will be doing uh, great things. So thank you, Ms. Wagner. Um, OK. Uh, thank you all for coming here today uh, to speak. Um, I'm an IU, an Indiana University alum, and I've seen the benefits that come from supporting entrepreneurial culture and ample access to early capital. One of the many examples of that is the IU, uh, at IU is the Shoemaker Innovation Center. This helps student entrepreneurs build, launch, and sustain their own businesses by providing resources, programs, and support. Another example is the IU Kelly School of Business, which is a highly renowned business school. Um, that alumni are represented in management companies of all shapes and sizes. Uh, we also in Southern Indiana have the Small Business Development Center, which um, does connect angel investors to um, startup um, businesses and assist them as they assist business owners as they're starting this process. Um, but that said, I know that not everyone has access to the resources and networks that come from established higher education institutions and local incubators, particularly in rural areas, which is um, part of my district certainly is um, rural small towns. Um, and we've heard Mr. Heisinga say that you know $200,000 here is not $200,000 there. Um, so my question is, uh, Mr. Velasquez, can you just explain uh, briefly uh, how expanding the investor definition would increase capital, not just for Silicon Valley, major metropolitan areas, um, but also in rural areas of the country, regardless of, of our demographics. Absolutely, thank you for the question. And, and one of the things that, that has come up, and, and, and we cannot pick and choose one, one solution. This is a multifaceted approach in order to get this complex asset class you know, more engaged and more involved. Well, I believe we can walk and chew gum at the same time, right? So it does involve education. It does involve, we're looking at the income thresholds. When you look at that from across the community, these communities can begin to understand where that best fits for them. I, I use a story, Lubbock, Texas, 250,000 individuals, right? Now there, we only have individuals that meet the income threshold, but there are others that could participate, like who? University professors, perhaps, right? So, but they're excluded. So one of the things you want to do is look at 
this, this, this solution from a multifaceted approach. We can incorporate multitude of these, of these um, opportunities or these legislation reforms in order to get more people involved. That being said, when it comes to rural communities, you have a very small population, right? So your angel group is likely to be very small. So in Lubbock, it was about 30 or so. In, others, in other cities, like in South Texas, it's about 15 to 20, right? It's very difficult for them to create critical mass around doing investing over and over and over again. When you expand the pathway, you bring more people into the fold, thereby expanding access to capital. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, my next question is for Ms. Schulp. Um, do you think that wealth, size, or assets under management, in the case of these institutional accredited uh, investors, does that accurately represent sophistication? I, I don't think that a determination of wealth accurately represents sophistication. And we've heard that um, you know the elderly are preyed upon. Um, does that um, you know are we to assume that also wealthy um, members of the uh, elderly community are also preyed upon, regardless of their sophistication, if it's only based on wealth. Yeah, I, I don't think wealth has anything to do with sophistication in these circumstances. Um, the elderly are unfortunately targets for security scams in all sorts of situations, not simply in the private markets. Thank you. My last question is for Ms. Bell, um, just about thoughts on risk. So I was a small business owner. I understood that there'd be a lot of risk involved in starting my business. I thought if I could only get one client, I could make it. Um, and I didn't understand or, or anticipate there would be a pandemic uh, when I started my business. Um, but I didn't need the government to protect me from myself. Um, so I'm wondering, um, can you build wealth without risk? Thank you, no. You can't build anything without, or you can't build a shelf without risk. I mean, I think, right. I think it's fair to say that when you journey into entrepreneurship, that entrepreneur spirit, you're going in knowing that you're taking a risk. Thank you. I just want to comment that, you know, we are built on capitalism in this economy, and um, having a vibrant and robust economy, I think, requires that we allow as many individuals as possible into these uh, investment opportunities. And um, Ms. Ms. Uh, Madam Chairwoman, I thank you for this time and I yield back. Gentleman, gentlelady uh, yields back. I now recognize the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Lynch. You're recognized, sir, for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. And let me congratulate you on your, your chairmanship. Uh, we're trying to balance here, right? We're, we're looking at the advantages that public, uh, public offerings have, the the menu of consumer protection laws that protect people, the requirements for disclosure that I think are very helpful to, to investors. Um, on the other hand, and, and, and we just saw that in the FTX situation. Uh, I'm the former chair of the FinTech Task Force. Um, we've seen absolute disasters as a result of the, the uh, small amount of information that was available to investors in FTX and, and other, uh, other crypto-centric uh, companies. So uh, some of them had nothing more than a, a white paper as a, a source of information for prospective investors. Um, the accredited investor definition has been found to be discriminatory towards underrepresented uh, investors and a barrier to capital formation for minority-owned entrepreneurs. I believe we should be shifting this conversation away from lowering the accredited investor standard and instead explore ways in which we can expand access to the public markets with their uh, commensurate consumer protections. Uh, and uh, as I said, uh, we held hearings last, last year, uh, last session, um, when I was chair of the Task Force on Financial Technology, and uh, we explored the FinTech venture capital space and the lack of diversity in startup founders. Uh, we found that uh, only 2% of venture capital funding, privately, goes to women-owned companies, and less than 3% goes to founders of color. And when you think about that, th those numbers are staggering when you consider that when on performance, when, when minority-owned companies receive the funding that they need, they actually outperform uh, their white male-owned company counterparts. And I, I'm, I'm truly skeptical. I could be persuaded, but I am not persuaded yet that lowering the accredited investor requirements will actually help minority-owned companies get the funding that they need in a safe and reliable way. Um, Professor Fletcher, could you, 
could you discuss whether this, this idea of just simply lowering the accredited investor standard would mitigate the funding um, discrepancies and imbalances uh, that are problematic for minority-owned businesses? Uh, thank you, Congressman, for your question. And my short answer to that is no, um, it will not. Lowering the accredited investor standard will not increase um, access to funding for um, people of color and for women founders. Uh, the fact is, as one of the things that uh, my co-panelist, Ms. Bell, noted earlier, is that networks right, build a lot of this funding. Um, and networks are shutting out uh, black and brown funders. That's not a question of the accredited investor definition. That's a question of the networks not being open up to people of color. And indeed, what I think uh, would, and women as well, of course, um, and indeed what I think lowering the accredited investor definition will do instead is open up um, the victims, the potential victims in this space, uh, given that there is a lack of investor protection. Um, and while I completely, I, I completely agree that there needs to be more funding for black and brown businesses, for women businesses, lowering the accredited investor standard is not the way to get to that funding. How do we, how do we untie that knot then? So we, we want access, we want uh, minority businesses and women businesses to have greater access to capital. We, we realize that the data indicates they're being unfairly treated. Uh, they're not being judged on the merits. Uh, yet we, we don't want to create a trap like we saw with FTX and some of these uh, uh, stable coins where there was no information, people flooded in and then lost their entire savings. It, how, how, do we, how do we rebalance that process? Um, I think that's an excellent question as well. I think I have a couple thoughts there. Um, one thought would be, even if we if we are going to uh, open up the private market some, then we do need to have more information within that space, right? It does not, as I said earlier, it doesn't have to be the full-blown public disclosure that we have in the public markets. Right, right. There, are, there are things in between. Yeah. Um, other options actually include, you know, when we had the pandemic, we turned to um, PPP loans. We thought about ways in which we could fund and support businesses during the pandemic. Those are other options that we can think of as well. Um, and one of the things that I want to note here is that even within our regulatory framework, we have Reg CF, Reg Crowdfunding, in which we, um, we are able to raise money for smaller businesses through funding portals of up to $5 million. And so there are currently options available that we can talk about and think about how to strengthen those options rather than going straight for lowering the accredited investor standard and opening up um, retail investors to potentially being victims of fraud and um, mis um, abuses within the private markets. That's great. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, my time has expired, and I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Now recognize the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Stile. You're recognized, sir, for five minutes. I thank the chair. I appreciate the proper Luxembourg pronunciation of the last name, uh, Madam Ambassador. Uh, and congratulations on your first hearing. It's good to be able to call you chairman, uh, or chairwoman, uh, chairman of the committee, uh, ambassador, congresswoman. It's great to be here. Uh, thanks for being here. I want to stage set a little bit. Um, I actually got a phone call uh, unsolicited to my office, as uh, many people like to call, uh, give their advice, guidance, counsel, their opinion of the day. Uh, and it was a gentleman actually from Beloit, Wisconsin, a, a city that's new to the congressional district, but a place that I spent about eight years working in, about 35,000 people. Uh, economically in some ways challenged, but an awesome city, uh, hardworking folks. Uh, and he called in and left a message uh, and was upset that he was blocked by the accredited investor standard uh, to invest in early stage companies. It's actually not a call that I get terribly often. Uh, it's usually, I got a lot of calls about the balloon last week, uh, some other topics admittedly. Uh, but this gentleman called in um, on that topic, and he was actually really frustrated uh, that the, invest the accredited investor standard prevented him from investing in early stage companies, allowing him to build wealth. And in his call, he said, quote, this law keeps the low income from entering high income status and on its face is unfair. And I think I pretty much agree with this, this gentleman who called the office. I, I got to call him back. I didn't get time between now and the hearing uh, to, to learn more about his story. But I think his story is the story of a lot of people, uh, people who have unique knowledge and expertise uh, in a given area, uh, but may not have hit the actual accredited investor standard uh, as written a long time ago. Uh, and so for sake of discussion, as I'd love to see a show of hands of how many of our panelists here today uh, are, are accredited investors. Okay, so, so not everyone, four out of five, and how many have been accredited investors for at least 10 years? One. So that, that, to me, flags an issue. We have absolute uh, experts here uh, at the table with us today, people who have shared with, shared with us uh, incredible stories, acumen on investing, 
understanding the issues before us, uh, but we only have one out of five who've been an accredited investor uh, for the past 10 years. That, that flags to me uh, that we have a challenge here uh, that Congress uh, can remedy because it was Congress that put in, in place uh, many of the rules and regulations uh, that oversee this standard. To dive in just a little further, if I can, uh, um, Mr. Velazquez, um, you described in your testimony you worked for companies for two decades to help early stage companies get funding and to build uh, angel networks in the U.S. and around the world. Uh, yet for your career, you didn't qualify, for much of your career, you didn't qualify as an invest accredited investor, what we just saw here with our panelists. Uh, is the founder of Investors of Color Network. Uh, can you describe how the current accredited investor standard excludes investment professionals who come from minority backgrounds uh, who start with less than inherited wealth? Uh, it, it absolutely limits their ability to participate. One of the biggest challenges we had with an Investors of Color was finding them. Uh, we spent four years building that network of, of 800 individuals uh, and organizations. And so, so we had to rely on small networks, small communities, gentlemen like, like maybe the one that called your office. Um, he, he would qualify. So we're not totally exclusive, but we want individuals that have been left out um, to be able to find pathways into it. And so, so what we're looking to do is create pathways. We're not deregulating. We're not reducing. We're expanding pathways for access. And this is what we're ultimately trying to advocate for. Thank you very much. And, and how, would, how would you respond to those that are arguing that current accredited investor standards um, is justified because it's necessary to protect investors? So I'll, I'll go back to statements I made earlier. Within the Angel Capital Association, 16,000 members, 250 angel networks, platforms, family offices. Um, we don't see that fraud. We invest $950 million into our economy every single year. We look at thousands and thousands and thousands of deals. Um, we don't see that fraud. You will see a bad company made by a group of friends who decided to go off and make an investment on their own. They maybe had fear of missing out. I would argue that those that meet, met that accredited investor definition and were claimed to be sophisticated yet made their investment in FTX under an assumption are not sophisticated investors because that's not what angels would do. Maybe I'll shift to you, Ms. Bell. Do, do you think the accredited investor standards are justified and necessary to protect investors? Thank you. I think it takes more than wealth um, to be able to determine whether or not someone is uh, sophisticated. And I think when um, my fellow panelists mentioned uh, Reg CF as, a, as an option, crowdfunding as an option, I think it's why do we have to be limited to, oh, well, you can do that, but you can't do this. I, 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 I think you're right. I think what we heard today is the need to look back and reform this provision. It leaves a lot of people out, the gentleman who called my office, people here at the table. Madam Chairwoman, I yield back. I thank the gentleman for yielding back. I believe that we are uh, out of witnesses uh, as a courtesy to the ranking member. I'm going to uh, allow us each 30 seconds to do a little wrap up, uh, and then I'll give some instruction for our, our, our witnesses, for, for others, and for our next hearing this afternoon. Ranking member. Private markets are important. They're inherently risky. They tend to be small and start up. You don't get the level of information. You don't have the level of liquidity. We shouldn't be lowering standards, but we should be rationalizing standards. We shouldn't have wealth as a barrier. We should have sophistication. So, and we have to define what is a sophisticated investor, determine whether you can be vicariously sophisticated by hiring an, an advisor, and any advisor has got to be absolutely independent. I yield back. And I'll just close by saying that Congress must work to expand opportunities for all investors uh, and entrepreneurs in the securities markets and in order to create long-term sustainable growth within our economy. You all sitting at this table are the essence of the American dream. You are the entrepreneurs. And we should not be regulatorily standing in your way to build your opportunities uh, for your families, and for, for others. I applaud each and every one of you. Mr. Velasquez, you have more than earned your wings. Uh, and, uh, and so of all of you at this table, it's been a pleasure. I thank you. And uh, we look forward to moving forward on some of these legislative proposals. Now, I'd like to thank again all the witnesses and say without objections, all members will have five legislative days within which to submit additional written questions for the witnesses to the chair. 
which will be forwarded to the witnesses for their response. I ask our witnesses to please respond as promptly as it, you are able to do so. And before adjourning, I, I want to just uh, remind, uh, not, not many remaining, but certainly staff is, we're going to have a hard gavel in the main hearing room at 2 o'clock because votes are going to be at 4. So we're going to try and do whatever we can to, to get through uh, our next hearing uh, in, in, that, in that time frame. So uh, without further ado, this hearing is adjourned. Thank you.